Hi, it's Mark Owen from Moves Marketing and PR, the editor of Punchline Magazine, and welcome to Punchline Talks, the big interview. Today, my special guest is Imam Hassan of the Masid e Nu Mosque. Basically, he's the CEO of the Rice Cross Street Mosque here in Gloucester. Welcome to Punchline Talks. Well, hello, lovely to see you again, Mark. Thanks for the invitation. No worries. We've known each other a good couple of years now, isn't it? Four or five years. And I've been to your mosque a couple of uh, a couple of times as well, and we're going to organise a tour very shortly. And I, the reason I wanted to get us together is that you know I'd be very fortunate to to have a visit. Can you tell us, please, about your role at the mosque and what you do, and how many people are members? Uh, so I'm not quite the CEO, but I'll accept that as a title. Uh, but don't be telling my bosses that I'm the CEO. Uh, I currently work and serve as a priest, as an imam at the mosque, and I've been at the mosque since 2014, March 2014. And uh, to, to give you an idea of how busy the mosque is, uh, we have roughly over 700 people attending the Friday prayer. That's every Friday uh, throughout the entire year. And if it's school holidays, when the children are school as well, the numbers can go up to up to 1,000. Uh, and those 700 odd people, they're from 30 different nationalities. Uh, and then people at the mosque have an, an option of becoming a member at the mosque, whereby they give a, a regular yearly donation to help the mosque function. And then aside from this, obviously people like to donate towards a religious institution, uh, a religious institution that they're benefiting from or their families are benefiting from. People would love to donate to the mosque. So is that how it actually makes its money? You know, a bit like a church, you have a collection pot. Is that the way it works? Yeah, definitely we've got collection pots. People will take collection tubs home. Every time someone comes to the mosque, they'll drop in a fiver, they'll drop in a tenner. And, and every, every so often a person feels very much connected to their religion. It's like an up and down. Uh, uh, at times in the year, you feel very spiritual. And at times of the year, you may never turn up to the mosque. But when you feel spiritual, because you have that connection with God, you feel the need to also help the mosque because without the donation of the people, a religious institution will struggle to function. So there are always people throughout the entire year that will donate to the mosque. And some people donate large amounts as well. I was going to say, is it down to the actual amount of money that you have? You know, so if you're a wealthy person, you, you have to give a little bit more or is it, it's not an requirement? No, there's no requirement. It's up to the individual. If you want to give one P, you want to give one pound, you give your one pound. If you want to give nothing, nobody will be uh, stopped at the ex exit of the door and they won't be uh, held to ransom. Give us your donation. So when I come to visit the mosque, then I, one of the questions I ask, you know, do you know, show, show my naivety? Do we have to take our shoes off? Uh, and, uh, you know, is there a set place that you pray? Yes, yeah, so because uh, we prostrate on the ground during prayer, uh, we remove our shoes on entry, so we pop them into the shoe racks. We've got hundreds of shoe racks around the building. Once we've taken our shoes off, we keep our socks on. If you've not got socks, there's nothing wrong with that as well. And then we'll head into the prayer room where we've got lovely carpets. People who stand and sit on those carpets say, I'm so glad I've removed my shoes. These carpet, carpets are so comfy. Now, it's a, it's a big room I've been in there, isn't it? And I, one of the things I, I often wonder is, do, do most people come and pray in the same place? Or, you know, because it's, it's a regular thing they do. So uh, most people, I would say, perform prayer at home because people have so many jobs and, uh, and so many responsibilities within the home. Most people would pray at home, uh, whether you return home from work or before you leave work, or you've come home or on a lunch break, you'd pray at home. Uh, there are many who during the day are at work, so they would perform prayer at work. So, for example, at the mosque, we have people from a range of professions we've got cleaners, people work for the NHS, people who work for the council, uh, business people, uh, we've got doctors, surgeons, lawyers, uh, barristers, accountants. So during the day, a lot of them are working. So during the after, uh, during the, the, their lunch break, when it's time for the afternoon prayer, a doctor, for example, in their surgery room, would perform their little, they'll have their lunch, do the little wash, which takes uh, less than a minute, pull the prayer mat out the drawer, lay it down, perform the prayer, prayer only takes three or four minutes, They'll uh, put the prayer mat away in their drawer, and it's as if nothing's happened. People within that building and all the patients and all the other doctors won't even realize that his doctor just performed their prayer. Uh, we have many people who attend the mosque who work in the takeaway restaurant industry, the catering industry, people who, uh, who are taxi drivers or run taxi firms. 
because they're free during the day, they may turn up to the mosque in the afternoon, but miss the evening prayers. So in between their shifts, somehow, somewhere along that line, in between serving customers food at the restaurant or takeaway, they may be given permission by their boss to go away for three minutes or four minutes and perform their prayer. And, and how many prayers do you have to, if you don't mind me asking, do you have to do a day? How does we, have, it we have five prayers. We have an early morning prayer before sunrise. And in the summer, it's difficult because sunrise is very early. We have the afternoon prayer. So we've got the entire afternoon during the summer months to perform the afternoon prayer. We've got a late afternoon prayer, a sunset prayer, and a late night prayer. Each prayer takes around, let's say, four minutes, five minutes, maybe six or seven minutes. So it's not the, the length of the actual prayer. It's, it's taking time out for the actual prayer where there needs to be huge commitment. So some, some individuals I know may pray once a day. There are others who pray three times a day. There are some who pray five times a day. There are some who pray five times a day for six months and may not perform a single prayer for the following six months. So everyone's spirituality level every single day can change. Is there, you know, nowadays, do you find that the workplace, you know, general society now is a lot, you know, moved on as in very ex acceptable to, to, you know, allow the workers to, to go off and pray? Every large business or institution or independent or, or uh, public sector organization where there are hundreds of staff employed will have something called a multi-faith prayer room. So it's not necessarily a mosque within your building or a church within your building. It's a multi-faith prayer room. Anyone who wants to go and worship or go for silent reflection would head into that room and do their little bit of worship. Now, how long have you been the, uh, the imam there? So I've been the Imam at the mosque since 2014, March 2014, so just over eight years. So has it, you know, coming into COVID, I mean, thankfully you would have known a lot of your, a lot of your members. How did it change, you know, when people couldn't go out and about? I think we were all confused. We ourselves as leaders, uh, we've never experienced such a thing. So we had to develop and educate ourselves into how we would pass on that message uh, through using technology. Uh, so you've been to the mosque, we have a radio transmitter receiver system. Every Muslim household, they purchase a receiver, which is a one-off purchase, may cost up to hundred pounds, and they would keep it plugged in at home. So whenever there's a prayer taking place at the mosque or a fundraising event or a graduation ceremony or a lecture, automatically their signal at home would pick up that signal and they would be tuned into everything that takes place at the mosque. And during COVID, when people were, the prevented from uh, entering the mosque because of COVID restrictions. People were, we, we, we were running more services online and we were delivering more lectures. So it would be, for example, I would, I would go to the mosque, deliver, deliver a lecture in front of nobody because nobody else was allowed, but there would be hundreds of people potentially listening at home to those programs. To make you feel like a BBC One presenter then? You, uh, you slip in the odd joke here and there. I actually found it less stressful. When there's no one in front of you, you can just go about your business and give the talk. When you've got hundreds of people in front of you, naturally, that brings your nerves out and uh, it, it can get quite tense at times as well. And you've got to remember to say the right thing at the right time and always. I was going to say, so if you're reading from the Quran and you get it wrong, do people come after you afterwards and tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, that, you made a mistake there? That has happened every so often. Someone may come to me and say, you said this, uh, but you missed this out. Uh, and I think that, that happens more rather than people pointing fingers and saying that was wrong. They would say, you said this, but you probably missed this and you should have said it like this and also this. I was going to say, so where are you from originally from? It, it, it's Leicester, isn't it? Yeah, so I was uh, born and brought up in, in Leicester. Uh, I, I graduated from an Islamic university also in Leicester. And then I started my first job uh, my first role as an imam at a mosque in Kingston upon Hull in the East Riding of Yorkshire. Uh, uh, so I've, I have traveled the countries from the Midlands, went over to the north, uh, that's the northeast, and then I've traveled down to the southwest and I've been here for eight years. Now, did it, was this something that you always wanted to do at school? You know, when you were a young kid kicking around in, in Leicester, did you always think, actually, you know, is your, is your family a religious family? We are religious, but we don't, uh, we don't, we haven't really had imams within our extended family. And it wasn't something I had in mind from a young age. I enrolled into an Islamic university. Uh, I had that desire to educate myself uh, with regards to my religion. And then once I graduated, I thought I have the qualities 
in becoming an imam. So then I, I found a job, my first job, and I thought I actually enjoy this because I get to meet lovely people, including yourself, Mark. <laughs> so how do you actually become an imam? Uh, What's the process? Anyone who graduates from a university, you've got the qualifications, you can choose to become and uh, go into whichever area or profession you want. Uh, so I had the qualities uh, that were suited for an imam. So I thought it would probably be best for me to become an imam. I could have gone into education and maybe become a teacher or, or, or taught at a university as a lecturer or gone into something else. But I just felt that the imam role is best suited for me. And once I got into it, I never looked back. I've just enjoyed it ever since. Now, I always find that, because uh, as you know, I used to live not far from right across the street itself. Uh, and uh, and it's such a great area, Barton Street. You know, unfortunately, it's got a bit of a bad reputation in some ways. Because, And I think that's because a lot of people don't go down there. There's such an eclectic mix of shops and businesses. Um, and there's so many different cultures and languages, isn't it? I know people who are very, very wealthy, who prefer to live in the Barter and Treadworth area because of the local amenities. You've got your local cultural shops, your international shops. The town centre is five minutes away. Gloucester Keys is less than 10 minutes walk. There are so many people, though the area is, I would say it is run down, uh, we would see it as a deprived area in one sense. However, there are many wealthy people who choose to live in that area because of the local amenities in that area. And so from, from the outside, I do hear people saying, we don't need to travel through Treadworth, it's dangerous, it's this and that. It's when you get to understand culture and you get to meet people, you'll realize how lovely that area is in, in other ways. Oh yeah, yeah, we may see uh, fly tipping and we may see rubbish on the street corner or peeping, people hanging out on street corners past midnight, but there are so many uh, good areas of the town in, in, in so many different ways. It's only when people walk through those streets and meet people, they realize this area has so much potential. There's so much coming out from this area. Well, as you know, I deliver punchlines all, all through the high street and, and Barn Street and around there as well. And everyone is so friendly. I lived off uh, Slaney Street for four years when I first moved to Gloucester. And, and I still love going back. And you're dead right. It, you know, the people are really, really lovely, really friendly. I, I would say the Bartra and Treadworth area, I would say, is underdeveloped, but not deprived. Because I think, I, I would say there are many wealthy people in Barton and Treadworth area that are probably more wealthy than people living all around the county. So it's definitely underdeveloped, but not deprived. So because there are lots of people who do have wealth, we do see shops doing really well. We see businesses doing well. You obviously deliver your punchline magazines to a lot of my friends and people from my congregation. Every time you deliver to them, straight away they see my picture on the front page and they message me, we'll see you again. <laughs> Uh, no, well, thank you very, thank you very much. No, and the other thing is, there's a lot of BMWs, a lot of Mercedes Benz. I've I've often said that around by Treadworth. There's a lot of people with a lot of money. There are some hidden away in driveways. So I need to take you for a real tour. <laughs> so anyway, so you were you were a kid in Leicester, and um, you know, have you got your brothers or sisters, and uh, are they live close to you? Yeah, I have a brother who lives in Leicester, and he works for the council. And then I've got a sister as well. He were, uh, she works uh, in a food stall, in a food truck. And she's been working this week at Treadbridge Cricket Ground, selling food outside the cricket ground. Are, so you, a big, are you a big cricket I, fan yourself? I do, love, I, I do love sports in general. I've always been a follower of sports. I don't think I necessarily play as many sports, but I, I do love keeping up to date with sports. That's my way of, uh, that's my downtime. That's where the, the way I refresh my mind after a busy day at work. And, and like I said earlier, because there are so many people at the mosque, because I'm talking and mixing with so many people, every person needs that downtime from uh, every so often. Uh, so that's how I, I would have my downtime. Well, that, that brings us back to the mosque and your sort of daily routine. What is your daily routine? Do you sort of get there at five o'clock and in the morning and you must you must work quite late as well because you are that you are the head of the kind of community. The community comes to you for lots and lots of information, don't they? My work, guidance, sorry. Yeah, so my work is not like a nine to five shift uh, with what we find with most people. It's more on and off. So I'm in and out of work. So I may be in, uh, I may be at work for an hour in the morning and then later on in the morning for a couple of hours and then late afternoon for a couple of hours in the evening a couple of hours. So if you were to add that time up. It would add up to 
seven, eight, nine hours uh, potentially in the day. And in between, I do get that free time. Uh, so it's not a nine to five shift, but it's, it adds up to eight hours by the end of the day. So I'm in and out. And at the moment, because the prayers in the summertime are pretty late because sunset is quite late, I do get home around 11 in the evening. So I do get more time in the afternoon off and I'm busy in the evenings at the mosque. And now, how does the, the other area where the mosque makes its money um, is, is really uh, not being funny when people die, isn't it? It's a, it's a, a, you know, we wrote a big piece in Punchline, the business of death, and you know, the Christian uh, uh, and um, ceremonies. I hate to say this, you know, it, it's a way of making money nowadays. Now, how, do, how does it work with you guys? A religious institution, for example, the Gloucester Cathedral is a huge building. They need millions, they need to turn over millions to be able to pay all their stuff and maintain that building. Our mosque is also a large building used by lots of people. So we need staff to teach the young children in our evening Muslim school. We need caretakers. Uh, we need other staff as well. Then we've got imams as well. So obviously mosques and religious institutions need to generate money. Uh, just like how businesses would earn money, they would need to operate in the same way to be able to maintain that building. So it's no different to a, a cathedral, for example. So, so when, when somebody dies, what's, what, what actually happens there, if you don't mind? The process is, for example, uh, we, we've got a, a, a specialist funeral service in Gloucester. So let's say I were, uh, uh, God give me a long life, let's say I was to die this morning, let's say uh, I died this morning at eight in the morning. So I'm talking about my own death here, not a very nice thing. But let's say... Thank you, you didn't. Yeah, you know, I'd have to find somebody else, you know. <laughs> day, so let's say... I passed away, I breathed my uh, uh, last at eight in the morning. So obviously we have to go through the process. We need a, a, a death certificate issued from uh, the doctor. We need to collect documents from the council and take it to the coroners. And then we get permit, we, the body is released. We then arrange the, uh, the burial at the cemetery. So if, if I were to pass away this morning, most likely by five in the evening, I would be buried, buried at Coney Hill Cemetery. That's how quick our process is. We do encourage people of our faith to be buried within three days, the first day possible, then the second day, and if not the third day. But our process is so thorough and uh, uh, it's working so well in Gloucestershire that a person can be buried if there are no complications in terms of the death certificate, a person was already ill. So the doctor would issue the death certificate straight away. If it's a sudden death, then obviously post-mortem, the young person suddenly dying, then obviously there's a post-mortem that delays it by two, three weeks potentially. But it, if a person was already dying anyway, people knew that we can get that person buried within eight or nine hours. The body is still warm when we're lowering the body in the grave. That's how quick we bury the people. Why is it done so quickly? Because we believe God gave us life and that we should return to him as soon as possible after death. And then once they're buried, we believe our soul is raised to the heavens. Oh, and that's why it's done so quickly. But surely that doesn't give time for relatives to come and grieve by the grave. I think... In our culture in Gloucester, I think people have been accustomed and uh, uh, they've, they've molded into a culture whereby they understand that the process is quick. So we need to mourn uh, within the first few hours. We'll invite people over to come straight away. But the actual mourning process does not end after the person is buried. We believe the mourning should take place for three days. So if I were to die today and be buried in the afternoon, we would continue mourning. Uh, a person's death for the uh, for, for a further three days. So families and relatives uh, could come and visit you or visit the cemetery, for example, and pay their respects. Uh, and, and you can carry on mourning if you'd like to. If you, you know. yeah. And the close family members, sometimes they, they, they struggle to, uh, to, to, uh, to process, it, process it all and they may continue mourning for months on end. Oh, okay, I didn't realise it was so quick, I'll be honest with you. Uh, now, what about um, um, fasting? Um, and, um, you know, obviously going through that, because that's that's a quite difficult process as well. Some people can't go, you know, for more than three hours without a bag of crisps or something. I'm always I'm always amazed how many people do that. So what's the what's the criteria there? What's the sort of I hate to say the word rules, but what is it? I think globally people live in a culture whereby it's no longer eating two or three meals. It's snacking every couple of hours. You eat at 10, you eat at 12, you eat at 3 in the afternoon, then 6 in the evening. Then before you go to bed, when you're watching tell, you'll have more snacks. So fasting is a way of self-control. We're told 
to dedicate an entire month of the year, which we call the fasting month of Ramadan, we dedicate the entire month uh, to uh, supporting the needy and to remind us of the poor people in the world who go through days, weeks, months and years without food, without drink or healthy food or drink. So we fast from sunrise to sunset for 30 continuous days. Uh, the only difference is, is all Muslims in the UK, we follow the same calendar as everyone else, the solar calendar, uh, the solar calendar, the Gregorian calendar, January the 1st to December the 31st. However, however, when it comes to the fasting month of Ramadan and the festivals of Eid and the pilgrimage to Mecca, we follow something called the lunar calendar, the Islamic calendar, or the Hijri calendar. And each month on average consists of 29 or 30 days in, in the year. Therefore, we run 10 days shorter each year. So the Islamic calendar and the fasting month of Ramadan moves 10 days early each year. So this year, we were fasting for the entire month of April and the festival of Eid was straight off the Ramadan, the 1st of May. But because we moved 10 days early each year, next year Ramadan will begin March 21st and Eid festival will be celebrated roughly uh, uh, April 22nd. Uh, so because we've been moving 10 days early each year, we've been through the difficult years. The last 10 or 15 years, especially a few years ago when we were fasting in the month of June, these are the longest days. A few years ago, we were fasting when sunrise was at 4 or 5 in the morning and sunset was at 9.30 in the evening. We were staying hungry and thirsty for around 18 to 19 hours a day. And it was a tough challenge because we live in Britain. It's an extreme time zone that we live in. So fasting was difficult. But it's like anything in life. The first few days is difficult. Once you get into a routine, after a few days, it gets easier. Doctors do say when a person eats and drinks less, their stomach does start to shrink. And they feel less hungry and thirsty. So the first few days, I hear lots of people in the mosque moaning and groaning. I'm really hungry. I'm thirsty. I can't do this, Imam Hassan. It's too hard. And by the fifth day, nobody's complaining. I think they just their stomach just understands there's no food till sunset. But because we've been fasting through the summer months, we're actually, we're actually going to enjoy the fasting over the next 15 years because we're moving into the winter months. And the shortest fast will be in the middle of winter when sunrise is at 8 and sunset is at four, we will barely feel the fast. Well, that's absolutely fascinating. I, 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 I've done the fasting diets actually, and, and you are right. After a while, your stomach just shrinks, isn't it? And, uh, uh, and you, get, you get absolutely used to it. One of the things you're, you're all very good at is, is getting schools to come to the mosque and trying to spread, you know, explain to people in the community, a bit like we're having this conversation now, how many schools do you have coming to you a year? A year we would roughly be working with, uh, it's, it's during school term, uh, so we host visits between Monday and Thursday. I would say in a year we work with around uh, 60 to 70 schools. Uh, at the moment, uh, our total list of schools, colleges, universities, private sector and public sector organisations that we have on the register, I would say we've got over 300 organizations that we work with at the moment. Wow. Uh, we're actually looking forward to uh, your visit as well. Yes, that's right. We've got, we've got a, a whole bunch of business people going along to uh, very shortly. If you'd like to come, by the way, if it's still going, drop me a line, market moves marketing with PR.co.uk. Uh, okay, we've got, we're kind of running out of time actually already. What should, I'm going to ask you, what's your, um, what kind of music are you listening to at the moment? So if I went into your car, Turn the engine on, the CD was there, or the cassette. What, what would you be playing? I like listening to soothing music. That's because the Quran, when I recite the Quran, I recite in a melodious voice. It needs to be soothing to have an impact on my own spirituality and the spirituality of others. So I like to listen to soothing music that would soothe my mind, and it would also prepare me for the next prayer. Because when I leave the prayer at the mosque, I need to recite aloud to hundreds of people. And I, I need to develop a, 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 a good sound, a good tune, and a good rhythm in order to have an impact on the congregation behind me. So I listened to the Quran recited uh, by various uh, reciters around the world. Uh, I listened to uh, faith-based uh, music, uh, whereby it's sung in a very soothing voice again. Do you read uh, normal fictional books as well, or do you do you normally read? You, you tend to just read the Quran. No, no, no. So I've got a couple of books in front of me. Uh, so the book I'm reading at the moment there's one Churchill and the Islamic World, uh, written by Warren Doctor. 
And then I've got a second book here. Uh, it's called The Empire Land, written by uh, Safnam Sangera, How Imperialism Has Shaped Modern Britain. So uh, this may be, uh, uh, I would say, controversial to perhaps some people, but uh, it's a really interesting book and it does open your mind. I, I encourage people to read books that open our mind to help us understand things from uh, uh, the perspective and ideology of people living in other parts of the world as well, because sometimes we can be in our little uh, shell. Uh, so I say to my Muslim congregation, I say to them, travel out, meet people and greet people. Otherwise, we won't know how people in other communities operate. And people living outside of the Muslim community in rural areas, I say, come and visit the community and meet people within the community, the Muslim community, so we understand them better as well. And that's why we host school visits. And I like to invite people and meet people as well. And then we have an understanding of each other. We, re we realize actually we, are, we have far more in common than we don't have in common. There you go. The only way we can understand the community is by meeting them. We can read things, we can see something on the telly, but until you've not met person in, in real life, you will never know what that person goes through day to day. It's a bit like, uh, you know, I, I've often said to you, the Muslim community and, you know, we, they kind of don't network together. Uh, and, um, you know, we, well, there's no need for, for, for them to come to a business. I say them, I shouldn't say them, but, you know, the Muslim community to go to a business breakfast um, because they meet everybody at the mosque. It's a fantastic place for networking because we've got people in every different profession at the mosque, from your doctors to your engineers to your cleaners. You want to network you want something done. If you're opening a business, for example, and you want business tips, there are plenty of business people at the mosque you could take advice from. Uh, let's say you want to be a doctor, you want advice from a professional senior doctor, you can come to the mosque and speak to doctors. Uh, uh, you want someone, let's say, uh, you, you're looking for a plumber, you come to the mosque, you'll probably find your plumber, you'll find your electrician, a fantastic place to network. <laughs> Sounds like a fantastic. Do they have their business cards on them as well? I can pass them, <laughs> pass them over during the. Yes, sometimes on the slide they are just posting a business card into your pocket. Yeah, I do see that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're coming up to the end of the interview, uh, unfortunately. So I've got to ask you, what's your top three business tips, please? Uh, I would say number one is get professional help. Uh, when I need to understand something or I need something done, I like to, uh, or, or I plan. To, to arrange or lead a, a, a project in the future. I like to take advice from other people who have been through that process or can navigate you in the right way. So I would always say, if you're opening a business, get professional help from people who are experienced, who know the, the trade, who know how it works to, to, to make it to the top. And, and also talk to people who have tried it but failed as well. Because sometimes it's not just about seeing someone has made it to the top. It's also learning from people who haven't made it. So you know that the harms as well of going into business. So that's number one. The second one, I would say networking with people is always important, regardless of which profession you're in, whether you're a priest at the mosque or you're a business person, you're a doctor, network with people. And that improves your day-to-day -day social skills and it opens your mind as well. Uh, and and, and the, the third, is, I would say, is uh, if you're running a business, or you, or you, you, you're planning to start up a new business, Start while you're still employed. If you're working for someone, do the business on the side. And when you see there's potential, then quit your job and then go into business. The risk many business people take is they quit their full-time job. That's their full-time salary gone. They go into their business. At the start, you're not really making much money. It's later on in life. If your income stopped here and you go into a business, you're going to run out of funds very quickly. So never quit your job straight away. Iman Hassan. Thanks ever so much for joining Punchline Talks. See you, see you soon. Right. Don't forget, please, if you like the show, please like, share and subscribe. Thanks for joining Punchline Talks. Goodbye.